Today, my guest is writer, producer, theater performer, dancer, and actor, Teal Scherer. You may recognize Teal from her show, Might Give Me Life, or from her performance as a Pulitzer Prize winner of the Canadian premiere, Cost of Living. So stay tuned. Welcome, Teal. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. That's awesome. Now, Teal, you're a multi-award winning actress an advocate for inclusion of performers with disabilities in the entertainment industry. So when did you catch the acting bug? I caught the acting bug in college. Um, I went to Oglethorpe University in Atlanta, Georgia, and I majored in communications. And as part of my major, I had to take a theater class and I just fell in love with it. Um, I think there are two things that were, that were really like pivotal. Um, one was my the my the professors the theater professors were super encouraging of me they could you know like they didn't treat me any differently because i had a disability if anything i felt like they thought it was like a good thing like an asset to my work okay. um and they cast me in plays playing roles that weren't disability specific and so they just made me feel like included and the second thing was that the theater department and then the the big theater at Oglethorpe University, which is also home to the Georgia Shakespeare Festival, was totally wheelchair accessible. Awesome. So I really lucked out in the fact that I had a theater that was ex- wheelchair accessible and that I had professors who um, included me. And um, yeah, it just like... It, it just clicked and I I haven't looked back. <laughs> That's what I've been doing ever since. It, it's an interesting parallel. It's like, you know, you're taking communications and then they say, no, you have to take a theater program as it's a, a form of communication. Yeah, well, it's just a class. I think I could choose between that or something else. Like they gave you choices and I thought theater, that's, yeah. That sounded Why not? like fun. Yeah, that <laughs> sounded like fun. It's something I'd kind of been interested in before, but where I grew up, that it wasn't really an option so it 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 was like I was definitely like excited to take a theater class cool now what type of preparation do you do before an audition yeah it is I mean I recently had an audition a couple days ago so it's like you learn the material that's the big thing um you know if you can you want to try to like have the lines memorized if you can but First and foremost, it's about connecting with the character and making a making a choice. Uh, like if the show is already, let's say, airing on TV, you like it's a good idea if you haven't already seen the show to maybe go watch an episode of it. So you okay. get an idea of the tone of the show. Uh, the big thing now is auditions are primarily self tapes now so you're not going in in person you're recording them at home so there's also the aspect of you're like your own producer now of your audition which <laughs> is not credited which, as such <laughs> which is a lot because you got to get the you know your camera set up you want the lighting to be good you have to have someone to read with uh you know who reads the other characters part with you you've got to um uh upload and edit the pieces together and then submit it. So it honestly, I feel like becomes a whole day production um, um, to get it. So there's lots of aspects right now, just, you know, besides just learning your, your part. Uh, So do you feel with the way the world is and and with the pandemic and stuff that, you know, we'll get away from eco casting and back into the audition room or just kind of maybe. I think you're going to see a mix. I think, I I think, I mean, the good thing about self tapes is, you know, the show I was auditioning for is casting out of Los Angeles, but they're, but they're open to any actor in the country for the part. So what's great is it allows me to audition for it um, because I'm physically not, I'm in Seattle, so I'm not going to go you know, be able to just go into a Los Angeles office. So, um, but I also know like, uh, but I, but I do think there will be in person as well, but I think there'll be a mix. Uh, So my question for you here with with this is that sometimes we, we get an audition sent to us and we get a breakdown. Do you ever feel a version of microaggression passing through of being like a box that's being checked versus I'm the right person and my talent's going to show? Yes. 
I had another audition recently that, oh my gosh, it's for like a primetime network show. I won't name which one, but the character has a disability, which is why I got the audition, um, mm-hmm. which is great because they're, I, I, okay, first I will say they're, they're committed to casting an actor with a disability for the role, which yes, yes. Awesome. But the part was so just, you know, stereotypical, the character, it awful because she's now in a wheelchair and life is awful. And it's that role, which I read it and I'm cringing. And it's so hard as an actor because it's like, yes, I want to work. I want to be on this primetime, you know, network show. The scene is with a great actor. But then it's also like, ah, oh, I don't, you know, I advocate for for accurate portrayal of disability. And by doing this role, I'm basically like pushing us back, you know, like showing another. So it's really difficult as an actor to like, to like make that decision of, hey, am I going to audition? And so this is what I did. I auditioned, but I ended up like changing a line that I hated because I thought that this line was so bad. So I changed it. And then I played the character in a way where she didn't feel sorry for herself. She was more just like laying out the facts and this shouldn't have happened. And this is why. And I didn't get the part and that's fine. But, and I did watch the episode and it's great. They did cast an actor with a disability, but it was that portrayal. It was like the, I feel bad for myself. This is awful. You know, and I'm tired. I'm tired of that narrative being put out there. So it's certainly interesting when you when you look at it from that perspective. And I mean, you do so many things and trying to make that character come to life and make it you right and and try to have that positive spin. It, It kind of feels like the industry is, you know, pitching one way and not looking at other avenues sometimes. Yes. So what is something that people tend to misunderstand about you the most? So I would say, for example, sometimes when I'm out in public, people look at me and they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I hope you get better soon. You know, I was in the checkout of a grocery store not too long ago. And the guy said to me, don't worry, when you die, God will heal you and you'll be able to walk again. You know, so I get these I'll just say people assume that because I'm a wheelchair user, that my life is awful Mm. and that it would be so much better if I wasn't in a wheelchair. And that is just not true (laughs) at all. So that would be the biggest misconception is, you know, yeah, I mean, having a disability isn't all roses and sunshine, obviously, but, you know, I have a great life. I have a good life. And I am proud to be a part of the disability community. And so I would just wish people would not think that, yeah, my life is so bad. (laughs) So it it kind of brings me to my next point is you're an active dancer. I mean, outside of acting, you're part of a dance company called Full Radius Dance. Yeah. So I started dancing with Full Radius Dance actually when I moved to Atlanta to go to college at Oglethorpe University. and. I heard about them. They're a physically integrated dance company. Okay. Uh, so they combine both dancers with and without disability and they create beautiful pieces of dance and perform all over Atlanta and they travel and they do advocacy work, educational work in schools. Fabulous. That working with them was um life-changing for me. I was injured when I was 14 years old in a car accident. And before my injury, I was a dancer. I was a cheerleader. Um, and after my injury, I was like, okay, is that still possible? Cause it's not like I see people represented in the media doing that kind of stuff. And I didn't really know any other disabled, uh, people, uh, after my injury, I wasn't exposed to a lot of other people with disabilities. So Becoming a part of Florida's dance was just, yeah, it changed everything for me. Um, awesome. Just, yeah, yeah. Now, Teal, we were talking about your dancing career uh, just before break here, but outside of dancing and acting, you're also an active rower on Seize the Oar. Is that right? Yeah. So I, um, 
I moved to Seattle about five years ago. And after I moved here, I um, heard about an adaptive rowing team. They're called Seize the Oar. And yeah, they take people with disabilities out on the water um, to row and we compete in different rowing competitions and uh, do workouts once a week. And so they're, they're just like a great organization um, that I was like, felt so happy to get involved with um, right after moving here because I met other people in the disability community and just being active out in on the water like that is is pretty cool so when we talk about disability and when you're talking about your education about accessibility when when people talk about accessibility and inclusion Mm -hmm. what stands out to you i just feel like accessibility and inclusion like it affects all of us so we should all be invested in it. I mean, you don't know, um, like like I said, I was injured when I was 14 years old. That's the last thing I expected to happen to me, but it did happen to me. So I think, you know, just because you don't have a disability, that doesn't mean you won't have a disability at some point, especially if no. you live long enough, you probably will. And it doesn't mean your child or a family member or a dear friend won't become disabled. And so like, why do we like, shy away from it and create so much stigma around it when instead I feel like everybody should be, you know, working to make sure we live in an accessible world that is free of stigmas surrounding disability and that's inclusive. It's interesting. I was talking with uh, Chris and a few people earlier that we were kind of raised and ingrained not to ask these questions and to kind of, you know, shy away. And, And it's just seemingly now that the world has changed to say, no, it's okay. We can talk about these things and then we can talk about them in a healthy, positive and educational way. So on that note, like, what is something that we as society need to change our perception on? I mean, yeah. And I mean, I, oh, that's a good question. It's, <laughs> there's so many things. Uh, I mean, I think I, you know, I've touched on some of them as far as It's just getting rid of those preconceived notions people have about disability, about that we can't live fulfilling, meaningful lives, that we can't contribute to society, that, um, you know, it's, it's, there's so many, I mean, ableism is real and thriving. And it's like, just thinking, just rethinking how you think about, Mm. about, about things and challenging yourself. you know, if you see somebody with a disability on public, don't turn your head. Or if your right. kid comes up and asks somebody, you know, with a disability, oh, what happened to you? Don't shush them. You know, it's like, it's, it's, it's all, it's all the things. So your columnist at New Mobility, is this kind of some of the stuff that you, that you write about? Well, I mean, what is nobility? How can people find more about that? Yeah. The column so, and things. Yeah. New Mobility Magazine is the membership magazine of United Spinal Association. Um, So New Mobility is a magazine for, it's like a lifestyle magazine for wheelchair users. And we cover everything from technology, um, health, uh, you know, adaptive sports, people in the media, everything, Uh, adaptive fashion, all the things. And uh, yeah, I mean, so we write about so, I mean, so many things, um, you know, from a disability perspective. And people can find us online at newmobility.com. Um, um, look up New Mobility Magazine. Uh, yeah, and we're all on all the social media platforms. So yes, I'm their media columnist and also sometimes write feature articles for them. And I host a like a online inter- interview series called New Mobility Live, which is on Instagram Live. So New Mobility Live on Instagram and newmobility.com uh, for the, yeah. the column and stuff like that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's interesting that you bring up fashion, New Mobility fashion. Um, I, I mean, it's kind of a, a question I'm going to throw at you. How do, what do you mean when we talk about New Mobility fashion or mobility fashion? Yeah. So yeah, it it is a fashion for, you know, people who use wheelchairs, like dressing, like what are, what are the best kind of clothes to wear? What shoes are going to stay on our feet? Um, there's a lot of different, uh, you know, uh, manufacturers now starting to make clothes for wheelchair users, like jeans that are easier to put on, easier to button, 
they don't have all the pockets and the stuff in the back. So you don't sit on it and get a pressure sore. So we're, we're seeing improvement in the fashion industry when it comes to them thinking about adaptive clothes. And then it's also just tips for wheelchair users, like on clothes that maybe work better or tips on, you know, how to do things. So it's, it's, yeah, it's a it's an interesting topic that's actually pretty that's pretty popular with our readers. That, that's really cool. And uh, it's just recently come up on our end. I'm like, wow, we don't really know a lot about this. So I'm happy that you mentioned that. So that yeah. uh, it's, uh, what's the site that they can go to check out the the clothing part? Yeah, it's the new mobility website. And you Perfect. can just go to the search and just maybe type in uh, fashion, adaptive fashion, um, And then we've done some really good articles on it. Yeah. And we're seeing manufacturers now starting to do like shoes that are easier to put on, like winter boots that have zippers on both sides. So you can easier, more easily get your foot in them. And um, yeah. That's cool. Now, now a lot of people don't know this, but you're kind of a little bit of a geek at heart. And you had the opportunity (laughs) to sit on a panel at Geek Girl Con. Yeah, so I was introduced to that world through a web series I was in called The Guild, um, which Felicia Day created. And I, uh, it's about a group of online gamers. And I came in in, I think it was season three, I was on um, kind of like the, the, their, the main group of gamers. I was there, one of their nemesis. And I was on this really cool, uh, gamer team with, uh, Will Wheaton was one of the actors and yeah, it was so much fun. So I was, that's how I was kind of brought into that wonderful world, um, was through that web series. And then from that have, yeah, been to a lot of different comic cons and geek girl con and all, all the things, which, which is so much fun. So what's, What's the strangest question you typically get asked or one that pops out of your mind that says, oh, man, that was just really out of left field? Oh, gosh. Well, OK. So just in general, as a wheelchair user, I get asked really, really, really weird questions. Um, I tackle a lot of that in my web series, My Gimpy Life, um, episode three, which is called Inspirational, kind of opens with it. There's a cold open, which is like word for word happened to me in real life, which where it was, I was leaving a bank of America and a guy just came up to me and was like, Hey, can I ask you something? And I was like, sure. And he was like, can you have sex? And, and then when I was like, uh, yeah, he was like, Oh, cool. Um, you want to go on a date sometime? (laughs) Um, so yeah, so that's like the cold open of episode three of my Gimpy life. And that's the thing. It's like, people just don't know. (laughs) I, it's it's more of an hilarious. awkward laugh on my end than than yeah. something funny. Just to be too fair, it's hilarious and also awkward and cringy and not appropriate and all the things. But that's just an example of the stuff that you know wheelchair users or people with disabilities deal with, and that's not uncommon to get asked that. I've heard that from other my other friends who are wheelchair users who have gotten that same question um, from strangers. Yeah. That's that's weird and awkward. Yeah, it is. It's so interesting as we were just chatting about these awkward exchanges that you're getting. Um, one of our previous guests was uh, Courtney Gilmore, who's a stand-up comedian, and actually has a whole set about awkward exchanges. Uh, didn't mention anything like you had, of course, uh, but just the, the weirdness of society. Mm-hmm. Um, I was looking at a rumor. I, I'm going to call it a rumor, but your name, <laughs> Teal. Did your father really name you after a type of duck? Yes, he did. My dad used to hunt duck and there is a breed of duck called teal and it has actually a teal colored feather. And actually not that long ago, we were at the zoo and there was a teal duck at the zoo in one of the <laughs> things. And I was like, oh, look, there's my, there's my namesake. Uh, yes. Yeah. So he, he was always like, I love that name teal. We're going to name our child. Uh, you know, if we have a child, we're going to name them teal. And he was very adamant about that. So I was the, the first born and I got teal. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I like it's, it. It's you know, a really like, cool story. Yeah. Yeah, I like it. It's a different name. I I have met a couple other teals, um, which is always kind of weird because I'm not used to like there being other teals, but <laughs> uh but it's 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 cool. It's different. So are there any projects that you're working on that we can know about? Like what's up and coming for you that you can tell us? Yeah, I mean, acting wise, I'm not sure yet. I've had, like I said, I've had some auditions and we'll see. 
those things tend to happen really quickly. And then, you know, uh, so, um, writing wise, I'm working on some pieces, um, for new mobility magazine, and I'm doing an interview for new mobility live next week, which will be on our Instagram. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's what's happening. And if people want to get involved with accessibility and inclusion, I mean, is there, is there a favorite website that you would say, Hey, you know what, if you want to learn more, or if you're just trying to, to be more involved, check out this website. It has all this information. Where would you gear people to? Yeah. I mean, our new mobility's parent organization, United Spinal Association has a lot of great resources. I mean, those are specific though, to people with spinal cord injuries. So I guess it's dependent on what area there's so many, you know, obviously specific areas in the disability community. So I think it depends on what it is that it is, but I know United Spinal has so much, so many resources and different advocacy issues they're working on. They go, they have a thing every year called Rule on Capitol Hill, where they go and actually lobby um, certain disability rights issues with senators across the country. And so they're very active. Um, Yeah. Awesome. Well, my, my last question for you is what makes Teal smile? Hmm. Well, my um, son makes me smile the most. I have a seven-year-old um, son oh. named River and he is so much fun and silly and goofy. And we, uh, we laugh a lot when we're together. We, my husband, I think we drive my husband crazy because we just like, we're so, we're so silly. He's definitely brought out the like mischievous child in me. Um, and so we both are like little troublemakers and, and laugh and have fun together. That's beautiful. Mm-hmm.